joining us here from Sports Illustrated, uh, back on the show, and SI.com legal analyst Michael McCann. How are you, Michael? I'm doing great, Rich, and yourself? I'm doing great. Help my viewers not read a brief uh, and my listeners not read a brief here. What happened yesterday in the Deflategate saga? Sure. So very basically, Ted Olson, the new lawyer for Tom Brady, argues the appellate court previously got it wrong, where Brady lost 2-1. to one. And the argument is that Brady wants a new hearing at the appellate level, either by the same judges who heard the case or all of the active judges, which would be 13 active judges plus one additional judge, would hear the case. They would hear the appeal over again. And in order to get that, it's very hard. They're granted at less than 1% of the time. So it's an ambitious request, not one likely to be granted. But the basic argument is that, A, the courts have decided it incorrectly. And as a result, there's confusion not only for Brady but for other parties, parties who are in labor management relations, that this isn't about Tom Brady, so the argument goes, that this is about the relationship between union employees and management. And that's important because this is a case where in order to get another hearing, Brady's going to have to show this isn't about whether footballs were or were not deflated, whether or not Roger Goodell was fair to him. It's whether or not Brady, as a union member, was treated impermissibly. Well, and the reason for that is because they have to make this seem like a larger issue than ball deflation in a four-game suspension in the NFL in order for this thing to move forward. Correct, Michael? Yeah, it, that's exactly right, Rich. If this case has the appearance of being a football matter that is of interest to you, me, and all of your listeners and many others, that's not really legally important. It has to have some weight on other parties. And, and Ted Olson argued it does have weight and also that it's inconsistent with other rulings. And that's a key argument because should, this, should Brady petition the Supreme Court later on, he has to show that this decision is in conflict with similar decisions in other federal circuits. So how do you think this will float? Well, you know, this court has moved pretty quickly in the Brady case, a lot faster than what Adrian Peterson has experienced in a different federal circuit. So my guess is that we're looking at weeks before there's a decision on whether to grant a rehearing. If a rehearing is granted, that's important because then there's a pretty good chance that Brady can play the entire 2016 season oh because the suspension would be postponed, stayed until there's a decision. So my instinct is that we'll find out within a period of weeks whether or not this will be granted, this rehearing. And if it isn't, then the next move for Tom Brady is to petition the United States Supreme Court, specifically Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who has control over this particular federal circuit, and they'll ask her to stay the case until the Supreme Court decides. It's another one of these very hard-to-get petitions, but this is a unique case, and really it involves arguably the two top appellate litigators in the country with Ted Olson on behalf of Brady and Paul Clement on behalf of the NFL. So it has some stars, but... You know, that alone isn't going to get it there. So, Michael McCann, Sports Illustrated, a legal analyst joining me here on the show. What is, in your estimation, Ted Olson's best argument to say that this is something for all United States citizens to have to pay attention to, and thus this court should hear the case? What is his strongest argument on that front? To me, the best argument is that this action by Roger Goodell was in contravention of the collective bargaining agreement that Goodell, by suspending Brady for four games and not even acknowledging that players who had used Stickham had at most been fined, let alone suspended, that the absence of that acknowledgement suggested that this was a more arbitrary decision than one that was reasoned. And the reason why that's important isn't whether or not Tom Brady plays four games, but because other members of a union could be in a similar situation where an arbitrator treats them unfairly and then they have nowhere to go, that that undermines the relationship between unionized employees and management. Now, that sounds good. The problem for Brady is this. The NFL system is really strange, and I don't mean that in necessarily a negative way. It's just odd where Roger Goodell is the fact finder, Roger Goodell is the punisher, and Roger Goodell is the arbitrator. There's no other industry where that exists, and that hurts Brady because it suggests that this is this unique world that the NFL lives in that isn't important for others but we'll see how it plays out well isn't that what the two judges who ruled in the nfl favor essentially said was yeah this is strange we don't see it too often but if you didn't like it you shouldn't have signed the collective bargaining agreement for yeah it. and that's that's the hard argument for brady to overcome it, it's surmountable but very hard because if you focus on that rich if you say what those judges said which is you know these protections that brady seeks aren't mentioned in the collective bargaining agreement and we as the judges aren't prepared to read in rights 
into a CBA that the union failed to get. Now, the other judges have said that's not the right way to look at it, that there are certain principles in labor management relations that are continuous, that don't need to be stated in a CBA, that should be acknowledged. So, yeah, that's why it's a 2-2 decision in a lot of ways. Four federal judges have looked at this, and it's 2-2. Uh, this is a divisive topic. Well, that's my, my was my next question for you, is that if Richard Berman and then the chief justice, if, uh, am I referring to him correctly, of, yeah. of the Second uh, Circuit, uh, said... Judge Katzman, right. Okay, th th said we we've, we've see this in favor of Brady, and the two other judges who ruled in favor of the NFL saw it that way. W what do you think the appetite is of the en banc, all of these judges sitting here saying, okay... Uh, this is in the public eye. It may not m really matter to Joe and Jane's six-pack, but we're in the public eye, and we need to break this tie. I think it helps, Brady, because of the fact that those judges are going to say this is a debatable issue where the outcome isn't obvious, where the right answer is not screaming in front of you, right? This wasn't some slam-dunk case for either side. So I think that does make the judges more likely to say, it's worth our time to consider this topic because it's interesting. Now, you're right, you know, Joe and Jane Sixpack are not necessarily impacted by this, but to the extent Ted Olson can convince the judges that they are impacted by it if they're in a union. And there are a lot of Americans, as we know, that are in a union and that have matters of, that have collective bargaining agreements that impact what happens when, when their employer claims they've done something wrong and they claim they didn't. That goes to process and notice. So that theme you know, goes beyond Brady, whether or not it's influential enough to get the rehearing, I don't know. But I think the odds are much better for Brady than they would be in most cases. Okay. And so now that we've given the consumers of this show all the information they require to be knowledgeable on the subject, uh, let's do the odds. Handicap this for me, Michael McCann. I, I think, Rich, the odds of getting a rehearing are probably in the 5 to 10 percent ballpark. They're, they're still low. They're very, I think they're much better than it is for a normal person, for, well, you know, for a typical person, but, but, but still low. But, but wasn't the Richard Berman cases, the percentage of his cases, to be overturned within that time frame of 5 to 10 percent? Yeah. Within so, that frame? Hey, and, and, Rich, I would put in, in each instance, yeah. the unlikely scenario occurred. Judge Berman wasn't supposed to vacate the arbitration award because that almost never happens, and then it did. And Judge Berman's decision, like you just mentioned, wasn't supposed to be reversed, and then it was. So, so you know, we're living in a world where probability doesn't matter. So then if, let's say, they do hear this on banc and then rule in Brady's favor, it would be up to the NFL to take it to the Supreme Court to Judge Ginsburg then? Yeah, and I'm sure they would, right? They would have to. Just for all of us, just because it's such a fun case. <laughs> well, I mean, shoot, you've got your class up there in, uh, in New Hampshire, right? You're... That's right. That's right. Deflate Gate 2 in the fall, so we're bringing it back. And Are you serious? Yeah. The, the University back. of New Hampshire School of Law. You thought this would just be a one-and-done course, right, for one year? Yeah, I, mean, I thought there was a chance we'd only do it once, but, but now I realize that this case is going to go on a while, and it's a really good teaching tool. It, students learn a lot about labor law. And, and related areas of law, intellectual property law to some extent. It's, it's a great learning tool for people to learn about the law. And in terms of uh, the report that just came out of the United States Congress, Michael, about uh, the NFL and the National Institute of Health and what the uh, Congressional Committee believes the NFL was doing to try and influence uh, money for, uh, for concussion, uh, analysis, is this playing in any way into the settlement that still hasn't been completely settled in that case, Michael? I, 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 think, I think that settlement's mostly over now. Some of the lawyers would say some of the players have opted out, mm -hmm. but th the reality is that it's so late in the stage that it's unlikely that this report, other than for purposes of public relations, and it certainly has a public relations impact, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's going to unwind a settlement that that it has essentially completed. So when do you think that's finally going to be completed and is not no longer essentially completed based on your knowledge or just working knowledge of this? Yeah, well, it, 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 these are things that there's always one remaining appeal left, uh, but it, it's, I would imagine by year's end there's a good chance that there's some resolution on that. But, but it won't really be resolution because there are parties who opted out, ex-players who opted out, that will you know, bring their own cases and they'll bring their own cases in the years ahead. This isn't going away concussion litigation. There are, there are going to be players who will continue to sue the NFL. Okay. And so lastly, before I let you go, uh, as we're hitting Memorial Day, come Labor Day, Tom Brady knows he's playing uh, all 16 games or he knows he's sitting out the first four? I, I think Brady probably will be sitting out the first four, but mm. I, I don't say that with great certainty. Thank you, Michael McCann. Appreciate it. Anytime. You bet. Sports Illustrated.
legal analyst. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.